Hey everybody, I'm the Drink Pro. We're here in Louisville, Kentucky at the Rabbit Hole Distillery. Let's go check it out. Ah, Louisville, the center of bourbon. Today I'm here in the East Market District, better known as Nulu. Lots of hip young distilleries are here trying to make a name for themselves, and none of them have made a bigger splash than Rabbit Hole Distillery. Today I meet with Adam Edwards. He's their digital brand ambassador, and he's going to take me through the location and have a few drinks along the way. Let's go take a look. <laughs> So Rabbit Hole established in 2012. What started Rabbit Hole was right before, you know, like in the mid 2000s, um, there was a guy named Kabe who was working up in Chicago as a psychologist. He was actually a certified psychoanalyst for 27 years. And he met a girl from Louisville named Heather. So before Kabe met Heather, he, you know, he was really like a big gin and scotch guy. Yeah. He really didn't know a whole lot about bourbon. He drank it, but he didn't really know a whole lot about it. And he hadn't really dipped his toes in that water yet. Yeah. And so Heather really just, she introduced them to, to bourbon. I mean, I think, you know, she's like, she felt like she was a Kentucky girl. It's probably her duty to turn him into a bourbon drinker. Uh, and she overshot the mark a little. Uh, so bourbon is science, but it is also art, right? It's like the crossroads between those two things. So it's always gonna be an authentic thing. People know when you're not being authentic. So transparency and authenticity are two big things that drove Cave to start Rabbit Hole. And in fact, he was actually having a, a conversation with Heather. He was driving along one day and he, and he said, honey, you know, I've just fallen in love with it. I've met a lot of amazing people, a lot of great distillers, read amazing history about, you know, the history of, of bourbon distilling in Kentucky. Let's do it. Let's sell the practice. Let's mortgage the house and let's open a bourbon distillery. And she said, I think this obsession of yours is going to lead the family down the rabbit hole. A really big part of rabbit hole is having that collective to support you to having that collaborative, you know, sort of collaborative culture here. So that if I can't do it, I can just walk over to Cave or Cameron Talley, who's our head of operations. He could have been the master distiller, but he didn't want to be. He's like, no, it makes sense. Let's keep that collaborative idea, right? And go to Cameron and be like, well, can you help me with this? Or can you explain to me this, right? He'll do that because that's how we are here. We all know each other. It's a family here. And I really, really tru truly feel like part of the family. And down here, you can see this. Uh, yeah, like you can see the char there. So they'll lower that pneumatic lift, roll the barrels on top of it, lift it up, start rolling them over, they'll drill out the bung there, and then they just keep rolling it. And so then they're just gonna sit there and let it filter. And so you can see, I mean, that is our filtration, that's it. Now that's not charcoal filtering. I think a lot of people see that and they go, oh, they're char charcoal filtering. That's not charcoal filtering. Charcoal filtering is where you're actually passing it through an activated charcoal filter, right? This is just the barrel char. That's all that is. And we'll, I mean, I'll tell you right now, I'll take handfuls of it and put it in my smoker at home. It's amazing. That's, that's awesome. incredible. All right, welcome to the atrium. You can smell that, right? Oh yeah. This is this is uh, smell of vision here. Um, obviously, the centerpiece of this room is our 48 foot tall copper still from Ben Dome, who makes 96% of the country's copper stills. So this is an 8,000 gallon mash cooker. Um, all of the mash tanks are also 8,000 gallon. It takes about four hours or so to cook. After it gets done cooking, it'll go underneath our feet and we're gonna send it through some chilled pipes, some double layer chilled pipes, bring the temperature down to about 67 or so, uh -huh. and then we'll fill one of these up. Now, these are all 8,000 gallons. We got four of them in here. Now, it looks like it's boiling, and it feels like it's boiling. You can put your hand over it and you can feel it. Yeah. It feels really hot. I will caution you, don't put your head over this and take a big breath. There's a lot of carbon dioxide sitting on top here. Colin's done it a million times. Oh. Uh, he's <laughs> you didn't hear me, he's listening. Um, but this one, yeah, you get a little hit of it, it gets you right here, right? Yeah. <laughs> Clears you right out. Clears your sinuses out. So, uh, you know, on Christmas Day or Thanksgiving Day, some of that, we'll shut down the still. I've been in here before where the still is off and the cooker is off and nothing else, no steam is moving. It sounds like snap, crackle, pop in here. That's what all the mash sounds like when it's going. And then this one's brand new. This is what it looks like after about eh, four hours. See that little circle right in the middle? Yeah. That's the start of the fermentation right there. So this is only 12 hours along. Oh. This is halfway through day one. You can already feel the heat coming off it just a little bit. You can smell it. The big difference, and this one's a little more grainy. It's a little sweeter smelling. Yeah. You know, whereas this one over here, that's beer, distiller's beer. This is 72 hours old. This is like eight to 10% alcohol. Yeah. If you want, you can touch it. Yeah, sure. We'll yeah, you can go ahead and you can taste it. Oh yeah, it's like a sour beer. Very sour, right? Yeah, that's just that alcohol. I mean, it's about 8%, 10% or so. And you really, lots of grain in yeah. there. I mean, this is definitely for bourbon, right? 
This right. isn't beer you want to really drink. It's had a lot of grain in it. Yeah. Um, but that's going to make a heck of a bourbon right there. You know, relatively early on, you get these big, fat, yep. ginormous bubbles. And then look at this. Yeah. Same amount of bubbles, maybe more activity, but they're a lot smaller. So the sugar is actually disappearing. It's getting, you know, replaced with alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol is not going to have the tensile strength of sugar. Think like, you know, when you get sugar on your hands, it's sticky, right? Yeah. You get alcohol on your hands, it evaporates. So these bubbles right here, they've got more kind of solid particles on them that are actually going to create a more tensile strength. Whereas at this point, that's starting to disappear. So now the smaller bubbles are breaking apart quicker. I always thought that was a science. I've never been that big into science. Like I've, that was like my worst subject in school. But the amount that I've learned being in this industry, it blows my mind every day. Science is so cool. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Really cool to me because like you could you could age a mash just by looking at it. Absolutely. Like if you if you do this for a while, you'll know if it's you ready know, just exactly. by looking in and going, oh yeah, it needs a little bit more time. Exactly. Exactly. Very cool. And I'm 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 getting there. Yeah, you can age that <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> so this is low wine. Um, you can see the color of it, right? It's not as pure yet. It's about 128 proof. So we're gonna double distill it. You can call it high wine, you can call it white dog. Um, you know, it's about, you know, about 138 proof or so. Let's see what we got coming off today. Woo! Oh yeah. Just Take a smell of that. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's good. Right here, put your hand out. We're gonna, we're gonna have some fun together. Check this out. Let's do it. So go ahead. This is the high wine. This is the high wine. Go ahead and rub it around. You know, give it a smell. You can kind of smell the, the alcohol more than oh, anything. Yeah. All right, you ready? Clap, clap. Smell it again. Smell the corn, oh, yeah. the grain. Yeah. Get sweeter. The more you kind of agitate it, get sweeter and sweeter. You start smelling the grains. Oh, it's yeah. not the alcohol. Now feel your hands. Feel how soft they are? That's the oil from the corn. It's amazing, right? You want to try some of it? Sure. Yeah. Great. And stick a finger in there. Give it a taste. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, pretty good, right? It's 138 proof. Doesn't really taste like it. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. It's super soft. That's the low fermentation that we're doing. We're keeping it really soft coming off this still because we don't want it super harsh going into the barrels. Right. And now before we gauge it, it's going to go here. This is our spirit safe. Uh, this is also made by Vendome. This is the largest spirit safe that they've ever made. It's a really beautiful piece of equipment. Um, it's really just for looking at nowadays. Spirit safes back in the day, they did serve a purpose. It was a place for the tax collector to come in to get your proof. And that's what you would tax you on, was what proof you're making. Um, it's not very fair. So we're doing a weeded bourbon today. Next week we might be you know, doing the four grain or the rye or something like that. So depending on when the tax man came in, you would pay a different tax. Yeah. So that's why they changed it to the barrels that you have aging. That's what gets taxed every single year. I, I've seen a lot of distillers that basically they started in or continue to exist in what amounted to, you know, repurposed barns. And so you guys have really taken a a much more thoughtful approach to design for the space. And that certainly I would think makes it more efficient. That's why this place was built. This place was built for two reasons. To make great bourbon and to show people how to do it. Very cool. And then this is Overlook. This is our cocktail bar and our event space. We call it Overlook because it overlooks the distillery. But of course, when you walk in here, you can also see it overlooks the city of Louisville. Yeah. And it's a beautiful view. Hey everybody, Kyle the Drink Pro. Thanks so much for joining us. You saw a little bit of the distillery and now we're gonna kind of parallel into the rabbit hole lineup. We've got five different things to taste here, and we've got Adam. How you doing, Kyle? I'm doing great, how are you? Man, I'm doing really good. Yeah, we're about to be doing even better, you I You better suspect. believe it, man. <laughs> so I am going to give you uh, a chance to sort of tell us about the different whiskeys we're gonna be tasting here yeah. uh, in line. Is there a an order that you think would be better or So, not? you know, we're gonna be going in the same order. They're kind of setting like this. We'll be going from our right, left. So okay. Perfect. your left to your right. We're gonna taste four whiskeys and a gin. Perfect. And uh, two of them are bourbons, two of them are whiskeys. 
one gin that's finished in a whiskey barrel. Perfect. And one of these is a finished whiskey too, right? It is the very last one. Yeah. All right. We're going to do the very last one, the Derringer. The but, uh, that's a PX Sherry, right? That is a PX Sherry. It's a Pedro Menes Sherry. The barrels, the Sherry barrels are coming from Antilla, Spain, a place called Cascanoia. Cascanoia. Yeah, Cascanoia. Okay. Very sense. cool. Very yeah, cool. Really cool story over there. Let's go ahead and dig into the first one here. Now, this Absolutely. is the, I don't, I can't see any of the labels. So, so this is Cave Hill. Cave Hill. This is what we like to call the OG bourbon. This all is right. uh, the first bourbon that Cave made. Now, before we dig into this, Kyle, yes. I will tell you, as the digital ambassador for Rabbit Hole, I am an ambassador first. Right. The digital part comes second. I am an ambassador first, and as an ambassador, you like to introduce people to whiskey, sure, right? Sure, absolutely. But I will tell you, my favorite thing is that first drink you have with someone. You can tell a lot about somebody by asking what they do, what their favorite color is, what their favorite dinosaur is, you can, you can ask, right? But you don't really know a person in, until you have a drink with them. So before we even dig into it, Cheers. Have a drink. Cheers. <laughs> so that first drink kind of warms you up. Oh, I always say you got to do three drinks. God, absolutely. You got to try it three different times. The first one you get shock and all. The second one you sort of get general sense of the flavors. The third one you really can hit the high notes and the low notes. You pick exactly up everything. Exactly right. One hundred. I completely agree with you. Um, now, Cave Hill talked a little bit about the grains. Yeah. On that tour, uh, this is a four grain bourbon. Okay. This does have wheat in it, but this is not a weeder. The wheat is not the flavoring grain. Yeah. The wheat is malted, so it's 70% corn and then 30% malt. So and this is the three different grains for each, or 10%, right? Exactly. So 10% malted wheat, 10% uh, malted barley, and then 10% of honey malted barley. And I think you mentioned before bit. that was like a lighter. Exactly. Malting. It's just a really little, it's a little bit of a toasting. Like, so after you malted the grain, you just toast it a little bit, it gets a honey color on it. Um, and that's really on the nose. Yeah. The honey is really strong on here. That yeah. honey malt is really strong. Um, but also tons of green apple, lots of baking spices, and those. I was gonna say the baking spices really stand out to me. Great, right? The barrels. I can really smell that cinnamon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's even like an allspice characteristic to mm -hmm. this, and that toasting of the barrel really helps bring out a lot of that spice. Yeah. Yeah, the apples. Yeah, it's kind of like an apple pie almost. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Very much so. And this is right at 95 proof. So when did you start working with Rabbit Hole? You said you've been in the industry 15 years, right? So I've been in the industry for 15 years. I started with the distillery like, like a month after they opened. Um, I was a tour guide. Mm. And then I just started helping, helping out, doing different things, you know, working with the distillers, joined the sensory panel, was doing tastings. Um, and after a while, I, I think they just knew that I was a geek about bourbon and I love talking about bourbon and they wanted somebody to be an ambassador, and they said, I think Adam's the right guy for the job. It says on the label it's at least two years old, Okay. right? Now, the reason we put that in there, first of all, we're always gonna put what we are at least on here when it comes to age. That doesn't mean that this is a two-year bourbon. This right. could be three years, it could be four years. Sure. We do incredibly small batches, mm -hmm. so we never blend more than 15 barrels at a time. 15, okay. Absolutely, never more than 15 barrels at a time. When you keep it that low, bottle to bottle sometimes, you get some differences. Now, mm -hmm. the main characteristics, the main flavor profile of Cave Hill is always gonna be the green apple, the baking spice, tons of honey, lots of spice up front, and just like creme brulee on the finish, right? Yeah. That's always gonna be there, but sometimes the spice might be stronger or the vanilla might be stronger, or you know what I mean? Yeah. It might change a little bit from bottle to bottle because of that small batching. Let's move to the next one here. So this is High Gold. High Gold. Now I've got a video of this one already floating around out there when I had a longer beard. <laughs> All right, so here's what I really like about these two bourbons. On paper, they look really similar, right? Mm -hmm. They're both 70% corn, they're both 30% malted, malted grains, right? Um, they are 95 proof. Boy, they're Even very the different color, on the nose, though. They really are. And the palate, the same thing. This is this is almost citrusy for me now. Yes. Tons of orange peel on this, right? It's like caramel and vanilla, and then just orange peel. In the wine world, you got sommeliers, right? And you yeah. got varietals. And so you go to a nice restaurant, you get a nice dinner, and you order the steak, the sommelier comes over and he says, you got the ribeye, here is, you know, you want this Chilean cab to go with it. That doesn't really exist in the whiskey world. We want to thank very culinarily. We're the sponsors of the James Beard Foundation because we understand what makes a really great dish. You can compose a dish just like you compose bourbon. So where this Cave Hill might, you know, better match with the, you know, spicy and rich barbecue, this one needs this is a much more delicate. On it. Exactly. Much more delicate. With it being a high rye, you would expect it to have a ton of spice. The spice is a little softer on this, and in fact, it's backwards. You know what I really like? Hill. I'd really like this with some salmon. Yes. 
Like Especially the citrus notes would pop. With, yes, and, and like I have actually done, so I've got a smoker at home. Yeah. I've cured salmon mm -hmm. and then smoked it and done it with the high gold. Oh, I bet that's Unbelievable. perfect. Unbelievable. Yeah. It's delicious. All right, now we gotta taste it. We've been talking too much about it. Yeah, the citrus remains, but that maltiness is very prominent, especially on the finish. In the mid-palate yes. and the finish, you can really tell it's got those those prominent malts. Oh, and there's almost, almost a smokiness in there. Yes. It's like, it's almost like you took like cinnamon sticks and you toasted them a little bit. Yeah. Right? And you start to get that deeper, richer sort of spice. Yeah. And this one, I mean, it's almost like fall. Like the high gold is fall, the cave hill is summer. High gold is named after Christian High Gold, who was a stonemason in oh, Louisville okay. in the 1850s. Uh, he, you know, we use a German rye for this. So we oh. use a malted German rye grain for that. Okay. So Christian High Gold. And, and we really try and pay homage to Louisville with these names. Yeah. Right? Um, I mean, in fact, you can see that with the next one, with, with Boxer Grail, I don't know how much you know about Louisville, but Louisville is a boxing grail, right? It is a boxer's grail city. The greatest boxer ever lived is from Louisville. And we really like to think of that culture where people, they gain direction. This rye, very corny, but I like to say it takes a stance. It's a boxer grail, right? Um, that this, is very corny, I'll give you that. Very corny, right? It's a little bit of a dad joke. You're welcome. Uh, this boxer grail now, the mash bills of these first two very unique. Yeah. This mash bill, this is a, this classic, is a mash bill. classic mash bill. Classic mash bill, right? Award-winning yeah. rye. 95.5, yeah. that is Larry Ebersold's mash bill. That was Cave's mentor, was Larry Ebersold. Mm -hmm. This is the rye we're gonna use. Yep. But there's a lot of ryes out there that are 95.5, and this is completely different than all of them. And why do you think that is? That is the barrels. It's the low fermentation, it's the type of still we use, the, the small blending, things like that, but the barrels. Just, I mean, this rye, it's so soft and sweet. Yeah, it's very sweet. A lot of the times the ryes will give you some of this herbal, almost mm -hmm. bitterness. Yes. And this one, you can smell the herbaceousness. But it's almost like a lemon balm. It's very yeah. sweet and soft. Very much so. And, and I mean, it's just Werther's original, <laughs> right on the nose for me. I do think there's a good green element in there. Uh -huh. I get mint, um, but also maybe a little bit of dill. Some people get you know, yeah. dill more than mint, or even like anise a little bit. Almost like that, almost a little See, bit See, I don't get licorice. much anise on this. You don't lose the rye, you can smell the rye. It's just not kicking you in the face. Now, we'll tell you, neat. So, cheers, cheers number three. Cheers. Neat, it keeps some of that softness. Mm. And it's still pretty sweet. But yeah. I will tell you, if you got some water, throw a drop of water in there. Yeah. It gets incredibly spicy. You think you add water to it and it like tames it down. When you add water to this, just a little bit, the spice gets so strong, the black pepper and the white pepper get really strong, and that sort of minty, black tea leaf sort of thing, that gets really strong on this. The more I keep tasting it, the more that, did you say black tea? Because I'm yeah. started getting that tea note in the mid palate and finish. Absolutely. That, um, oh, and a little bit of that spiciness too. It starts to show up the more you keep coming back to it. Yep. The finish on this is really one of my favorite finishes on a rye that I've tasted. Like, it's... It keeps evolving. Mm -hmm. It's not stable in, in a good way. <laughs> well, it's a boxer grill, right? It yeah. takes that stance. Like I was saying, this whiskey adapts to you. It really does, and it, it, it changes through its layers. I think that rye really is complex yeah. for such a simple mash bill. Oh, yeah. It is, yeah. It's, it's more complex than you'd think. And like you said, the 95.5 is such a classic mash bill. I think part of why it's classic is it's versatile. You know, it's it's the you can do 100% rye, but it, it kind of... Um, I always feel like it's sort of one noted, yeah. which is not surprising. But you gotta showcase the rye right. as much as you can. And that's, and that's and just five a little is bit enough. That exactly. you know. It's just enough to get that that enzyme going in there, get the diastasis right. going, that you don't have to add like pre malt. You wanna take a hard left turn with me? <laughs> We're about to, aren't we? We're going into take some a hard gym left here. Turn. I wanna know what you think like, the most concerning and the most exciting trends are in whiskey today. So I will tell you what the most concerning is to me yeah. is. When I talk to people who may be newer to bourbon, you know, maybe just a year in or something like that, and they think, oh, this is a terrible time to get in bourbon. You know, I hear that you used to be able to walk in and find all these bottles on the shelf that are limited now. And I always tell people, you know, when they say that to me, I say, you're wrong. This is the most exciting time to be in bourbon. Right. Because there's so much new, it's kind of like I was saying earlier, right? It used to be you walk into a liquor store and there's 30 bottles of bourbon on the shelf, but there's four people making everything. Mm. Now. It's so varied and it's so vast, and you're getting things like us, this really distinct, unique take on mash bills and finishings and, and pairings and right. food. This is a great time to be 
getting into bourbon. So I guess my concerning and exciting kind of live in the same world. I'm concerned that all these people become cynical because they can't find, you know, they, they get caught up and they hear about this bottle and it's like yeah. the greatest thing ever. They can never find it. And then they just throw their hands up and they get mad and they walk away. Just buy a bottle. I ask you the question, so I'll answer it too. I think my the thing I'm most concerned about um, is sort of related. It's, it's people, you know, getting too narrow in such a wide world of whiskey. I hear so many people complain about, oh, I can't ever find Rock Hill Farms. I can't ever find Elmer T. Lee. It's like, you're looking at one mash bill from one distillery. There are, like you said, hundreds of distilleries, and there used to be even more, and I expect yeah. us to have more soon. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and yes, those, those whiskeys are damn near impossible to find now, but there are good whiskeys out there, and it's not that hard to find something unique. That's why I think this is one of the best times to be in whiskey is, you know, historically, yes, you could find very good pours, but it was one kind of thing, or maybe two kinds of things. Not anymore. It's changed. Yeah. And, I mean, just to see the, the industry change so much over the past decade, yeah. that's exciting. Based on what you've seen here, are you really excited about anything upcoming that you can actually talk about? Anything yeah. you know that Rabbit Hole's coming out with soon? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think I was talking about it a little earlier, we're experimenting with some chocolate malts. Yeah. And so I have no idea when it, you know, maybe we'll never release it because we're still aging them. Maybe sure. they won't turn out good or something. Sure. But I, you know, the beer has been amazing. Like that, that distiller's beer to smell yeah. that smells like Cocoa Puffs. I've had some of the stuff that we got, you know, we had made it and aged it for about two years. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really exciting. Um, it is very complex. And some of those deep coffee and cocoa notes that are coming out of mm -hmm. it, of that it's a it's a five grain and it's got yeah. two different types of chocolate malts. There's a chocolate wheat right. and a chocolate um, malt barley in there. Um, and there's actually two different types of rye in there as well. Right. Because um, these are two different types of rye. This is, you know, this is Can uh, German rye, this is Canadian rye. And so we're using two different types of rye as well. And one of them is malted, one of them is not. Right. So it has a ton of malt. I mean, it's 35, 40% malt as well. Um, still majority corn, so it's a bourbon. Sure. But I'm really excited about that. I don't know when that'll be out. You never know, it might age and we're just like, Ugh. You had mentioned before that, uh, you know, Cave didn't want to just be sourcing whiskey no. and he went in using somebody else's still with the grains he was already getting his hands on to do the initial distillate before this location was built. I think that's really interesting and, and, and cool because you're right, so many people are sourcing. People don't like sourced whiskey just because it's sourced and I think that's a mistake. That is a mistake. But I do think it's fun that somebody knew that he they could access sourced whiskey and said, no, no, I want to do my own thing and not just, I mean, releasing gin is a very standard release, but if you also want to release whiskey, you've got to go somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, we could have started with gin and made the bourbon and aged it, you know, and, and, right. and you use the gin to kind of keep our capital up. Coffee's like, I'm not starting a gin distillery. I'm making good gin, right? Yeah. But we don't make this gin. We import this gin. We finish it in mm -hmm. rye barrels. I mean, really, I mean, look at the color. That's not a normal gin. Yeah, the rye right? barrel gave it something. The rye for barrel gives sure. a ton of color. How long it, is it in the rye barrel? About six months. Six so months. it can be as little as three. It can be as much as nine. That's still not as yeah. much time as I would expect to get that kind of color. That off. kind of color. I mean, and the nose on it, gin, a London dry gin. To be a London dry gin, it has to be at least 70%. Is this London dry? This is London dry. See, this is way sweeter than you'd expect yes. from a London dry. Because it has to be at least 70% juniper, right? To yeah. Be a London dry. Right. That rye barrel kind of takes the edge off that juniper. Like, I mean, honestly, it smells like limoncello. Yeah, it does. Right? Yeah, you wouldn't expect this to be, you wouldn't know this was a gin if so you yeah. weren't told. No, I mean, it's 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 like limoncello and like even like a little, little kind of tea in there as mm -hmm. well. Lots of yeah, lemon. Yeah, I get some, yeah, and, mintiness. Yeah. Lemon, minty. But I will tell you, it straight up tastes like limoncello and Earl Grey tea. <laughs> and even if you're not a gin person, this is a gin for non-gin drinkers. There you go. Cheers, guys. You can tell it's gin on the finish. It's got some classic gin notes, but they're so um, balanced out with that sweetness and almost a creaminess on the Very main palate. Creamy. Yeah, which you it's, don't expect from gin at from all. From gin, right? That's not a word you use for gin no, a lot. No, that's why I was like, creamy, that's weird. Right? Why is it creamy? Um, I think in 2018, I think it was Forbes magazine, named this, I think it was the best gin to drink neat in America, which is like a weird award, but it, it's not wrong. I, that, did I almost turn you into a gin drinker? That one might one? come home with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this one, I think this one gets people. They, yeah. A lot of people come into this, they go, I'm at a bourbon distillery. I don't want to drink gin. And then they try this and they're like, okay, I'll get a bottle. Like, <laughs> right. Yeah, this is one you just have to taste to believe. That's fantastic. All right, so we've got one whiskey left to taste. And this is the finished in PX Sherry Derringer. Derringer, absolutely. So, you know, we've kind of talked about the names of all these. Um, Derringer really speaks to the love story. 
between cave and tether. It takes the kind of tenets of a finished scotch, so lots of great sherry scotches out there. Yeah. He said, why can't you do that to a Kentucky bourbon, right? So we take an American bourbon, right, and we finish it in PX sherry casks for, uh, it's just kind of like with the gin, like six to nine months, sometimes as little as three, sometimes as much as nine, but usually okay. around six months. Um, and that's what you get on the nose. I mean, the sherry right away, right? Yeah. Just cherries and almonds and chocolate all day. Um, and then the palette on this, it's just more of that marzipan, cherries, figs, raisin, chocolate, caramel. Um, the finish is, it's crazy, as complex and as sweet as this is, the finish is dry. Yeah. It's a dry, quick finish, which I'm I think actually is getting, good balance. I'm getting a lot of like creme brulee on the nose here. The van I mean, you know, there's that toasted barrel, right? Now this yeah. one, we were talking about barrel chars earlier. Yeah. This one is a four. Whereas See, everything that's, else is that's three. coming through for this me. Is a four. I can really you sense can get that. more of that sweetness, right? Yeah. More of the vanillins are in there. Yeah. Those, uh, what do you call them, lignans? Those lignans are really coming out in this from that four char. Ridiculous. I, I drink this for a living, and I just still, every time I take a drink of Derringer, I'm just wowed every single time. Just the supple, the Ooh. softness, thickness of it. There's almost like a nuttiness in the mid oh, yeah. that I really enjoy. Almond for days on this. And I'll tell you, we were talking about cigars earlier. Yeah. Cigar with this is phenomenal, especially oh, yeah. something like a Liga Pravada, like a dark cigar. Uh, Diesel makes some really great cigars for us, Whiskey Row cigars. They, one of them, they finished the wrapper in the Cafo barrels. The other one, they finished the wrapper in the Derringer. This is the dessert. And I mean, you compare yeah. it with dessert, you compare it with chocolate. Oh yeah, you know, you could like, dessert, really. if you were really feeling fancy, you could pour this over ice cream and just have a blast. Yeah, you could. <laughs> I'd rather drink it, but like I said, there's no wrong way to drink your bourbon, right? You drink your bourbon the way you want to drink it. Right. Well, what I would really do is make it a reduction with caramel. Now you're talking. Right. Yeah. Is that better? Is that, that chef-y I cook you? with a lot. I cook with a lot of bourbon. I When I do chili, <laughs> I deglaze everything with there bourbon. There you go. I deglaze the onions. There you go. chili and bourbon and every... I can hear my wife's eyes rolling from here. Honestly. <laughs> like, she's got more bourbon, you know, but it's great. It's a great cooking element. It's not incredibly long finish. It lingers, but it's dry. For as sweet as that bourbon yeah, can be. Yeah, it starts off right? super sweet, yeah. and then you get into that almost nuttiness. And then it does, it gives you that like dry oak, yeah. which I don't usually expect from a sherry finish. That's the bourbon. That's the bourbon. So that's the difference, right? Like sherried finished scotches, their first eight, I mean, they, they don't have the Kentucky weather in scotch, right. right? It doesn't get as much of the barrel influence. Right. Between six and nine months, like that's a good amount of time for a sherry mm -hmm. finish because it gives you that sweetness without getting stuck with. There, there are a lot of things about sherry I don't like. Mm -hmm. You know, right out of the gate. I don't like a lot of sherried whiskeys. Yeah. But this is light enough on the sherry that you know it's there and you get the sweetness without getting, um, I guess I would call it that almost fermented wine quality. Yeah, it's not whiny. Right. Yeah, it's not whiny. It doesn't have the grapey. This right, of it, right. The yeah, and I like grape on some flavors, yeah. but not the but not spent the wine, wine grapes. grapes. Absolutely <laughs> not. Yeah. I mean, like I said earlier, it's all about balance. Yeah. It's all about balance with this, and it took a lot of work. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today, and I was really excited to, to taste the lineup of whiskeys. What a terrible job I have, right? I know, right? You Everyone's must always be, like, "Gosh, it was so nice for you to do it." I'm like, "Are you serious? So nice for you to get come in here and let me do it." <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm happy to I'm happy to check out the place. It's a very cool distillery, great location. If you guys are ever in Louisville, this is in New Lou, isn't it? It is in New. Yeah. Lou. If you're in New Lou, come check out Rabbit Hole. It's a, a nice little location. It's pretty central to a lot of other things too. So uh, we might go grab a bite after this. <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks so much for having us. Cheers. All right, guys, keep drinking like professionals. Cheers.